Hello, hackers burning the midnight oil. My name is Jex, and today we're gonna go through some hack the box history with the machine. See, this machine made by TRX and the Cyber Geek was actually based off of an original concept created by the founders of Hack the Box to test you before you got in. At the end of each stream, we're gonna start condensing all of what we learned into a good like explanation. But if you wanna catch all the action, go ahead and check out the VOD itself. And if you're a beginner, I'm going to start adding modules for portions that I feel like needed a little bit of context, just so you can learn those things on your own time. Be sure to stick around for some extra information at the end. But let's go back in time to old Hack the Box. I like to do my tried and true nmap command right here, which is nmap of the target. So that's going to be the IP itself, uh, yeah. a min rate of 5,000. Okay. So I like to do this for hack the box machines just because one, I'm using my own instance because I have VIP plus, which is sick. And two, it just makes it quicker. You know, min rate 5,000 is 5,000 packets per second, if I remember correctly. So it's a mm -hmm. very fast, very loud, very angry scan, but it gets the results pretty quickly. I like <laughs> just yelling always, at the, it's just yelling. You're yelling at the each, machine. All the ports, we're just yelling at each one. Yeah. Very yeah. loudly, very quickly. I like wow. to output my nmap scan results to an output file. This is OA, so it's output all. Mm -hmm. So it outputs it in XML, nmap, and greppable nmap format, which we'll look at in a second. And then tac tac open just says only open port. So it's only going to show the open ports. So you can see how quick okay. that was. Like super, yeah. super quick. And if I look at the files, I have init.gnmap, which is going to be a greppable nmap format. And then I have init nmap init.xml. Yeah. yeah, I guess we'll go top to bottom then. We'll uh, yeah, let's top, see top to bottom, bottom. The, the target. Sweet. We'll do it without walkthrough mode. So I'm going to clear the cache because there's some cat yeah. cache. Okay, cool. So super, super quick rundown. Um, web application. We've already done nmap. We saw there's SSH and 80 open. We well, didn't do a server mm -hmm. scan, but we could just manually confirm 80 is web server SSH or 22 is SSH. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the web server, a lot of static files, you know, CSS, JavaScript, etc. There's some API calls, which ended up being old files because they, you could see the location goes to 404. So yeah. quickly, we went through the hrefs just to see there's a lot of anchor tags because this is like a copied site from old school from way back in the day. Um, but we saw a couple uh, resources we could hit login and invite. So we went ahead and looked at both. We went and looked at aug login and looked at invite and going to invite specifically showed us some JavaScript files. Love us JavaScript files, especially when we deal with API requests. But again, before we do that, we're mapping the application, interacting with the application just like a normal user would so we can see the entirety of the workflow that an end user normally would. There's invite. We can go to login just so we have a quick login request, see what that looks like. And we're doing this whole thing while proxying the browser through burp or your interception proxy of choice. There's only one correct answer in my opinion. Of course, we're proxying it through some type of interception proxy of choice. So we have API calls here, which look great. API v1 verify. Um, and then that JavaScript file is really useful. It's in that JavaScript file and JavaScript files in general, whenever you're dealing with very heavy client side applications that call back in APIs, you want to parse those files for additional API endpoints to see if maybe the attack service can be enumerated, not just with automation, but mm -hmm. via the information the application has given you already. We'll take it, right? So invite API had like a lot of weird obfuscation going on, but we recognize that verify matched another endpoint that we saw originally, which is API v1 invite verify, right? So if we throw this to repeater so we can just play around with it and we send that, uh, it does verify whether or not the code exists. But if we look at that JavaScript file once again, we could try some of these other strings that exist here and see that's not it. We could try some of these other strings that exist here <laughs> to see if maybe these are other API endpoints. And we went ahead and tried generate and generate actually gave us a code and it says it was encoded. We saw the equal sign, usually fairly safe to assume that's base64 encoding, but who knows? We can verify that though by either right click, convert section, base64 decode, or we can highlight it and use the shortcut, which I like to do, Control Shift B or Command Shift B if you're on Mac, right? And so we have this and we can confirm that this is actually an invite code by going back to the verify API endpoint, which is here. And we'll kill that changing that code to match our code and we can see that it was a valid code. So now we can just go via the UI, send it, sign up, and we registered for an account. So the, we account, the account we registered registered for was gar at htb.com with the password of testing. Now, of course, your thinking caps are probably going crazy because I'm immediately seeing error equals user not found. Reflection mm -hmm. of input, great place to check for things like cross-site scripting, server-side template injection, maybe client-side template injection, a lot of things. But we're not going to not gonna go down any rabbit holes. We're just trying to cook. So we're going to log in as ourself. And when we log in as ourself, we can see we have new functions exposed to us. But not only is it new functionality exposed, we also have a privilege session. And so now enumeration, enumeration can be leveraged. I like to, I like to enumerate directories, API endpoints, things like that post authentication, because once I'm authenticated, now I might be able to be, see more than I normally could. It's good to do pre and post just to see if there's a, a behavior difference. And whenever you're actually testing, especially if you're not having to worry about being quiet or uh, worrying about noise for the most part, sending more requests, as long as you're not taking down a server, sending an extra request is 
always worthwhile because it's, it's always going to give you an answer to that question. Does this exist? Is this vulnerable? So send the request. Like some, I know some people that kind of get into, the, into web app hacking or bug bounty. I, I've seen some that have like two or three repeater tabs and kind of stick to not that many. But I encourage mm -hmm. you send as many requests as you can. Just be cognizant of the server load and stuff like that. But anyway, one thing we like to do or I like to do through automation is always do automation while in the background while doing manual testing. And one of the things I like to check for is going to be enumeration of API endpoints and directories and resources, right? Obviously, what I'm looking for is variants, variants from the expect. So if it doesn't exist, it's going to 301 to the 404, right? 301 in that it redirects to the location header, which in this case is 404. But if it does exist, it gives me method not allowed. So this is something I can look for through my enumeration is variants from a not found response to a whatever else response, right? Going down this path, we can see eventually you hit a route list. And if I show this in response, show response in browser, that leads us to uh, the routes, the API endpoints that are accessible or uh, are exposed via this application. And so leveraging this, there's a couple admin endpoints that look pretty sick. There's auth, there's VPN generate, there's settings update. And then we tried those. So let me go ahead and grab mm -hmm. my session token just to kind of keep it simple. We tried those. We tried uh, generate and well, technically we're admin. So let me go back. Um, uh, let's call some of these admin endpoints. We quickly went through and we saw admin settings update was an mm -hmm. endpoint and it said method not allowed. We have to copy the method that's in the routes file. So put in this case, it says invalid content type. So it's expecting a different content type as an API, it could be application JSON, application XML, a lot of weird things. In this case, it's application JSON. We just create a JSON object on the fly. Luckily, the application is saying, yo, we're expecting an email parameter. And so let's go ahead and use ourselves. Greg Gar at hackthebox.com. Is admins another one? Comma is underscore admin and we'll make it zero. I think I originally made it a string and it didn't like that. So I changed that to zero and it actually works, right? And so we can call this other endpoint with our session token, send it. And it says we're false, we're not an admin. If I change this to one, send it again, we are an admin. And so now we can interact with administrative functionality. So if I go back to this one, generate with my username, it generates a, a VPN config file. And from here, I could test for a lot of things. I could check for username enumeration to see if I could generate VPN configs for other users and connect to those users. But what what we ended up doing is let's if config ton zero. Uh, NC dash NLBP four four three. What we did is we tried to confirm command injection through out of band interaction. So we did semicolon because we did semicolon ID and semicolon ID didn't return any like standard out of the command. So we went ahead and tried curl on port four four three to see if that works. And boom, we got curl. So we confirm command injection. And from here we can either get a reverse shell or we can try to exfiltrate the outputs of these commands through. So we confirm command injection dub 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 data and then we just set up a quick netcat listener on four four three. We leverage this Python. Python 3 one after doing which Python 3 pasted this uh, escaped the double quotes just to confirm just because we're dealing with JSON we want to make sure we escape those double quotes sent it and then we got a shell is dub 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 data so that was the that was the initial access that was a user yep that's the foothold yep. and then we it, and then it got tricky yeah for the experience of this portion let's go straight into how you did the exploit yeah so long story short we found a specific priv s vector um, there is uh, let me just ssh to admin real quick Okay, so there is a file var mail admin that basically discloses that there is a CVE that affects this version of Linux that leverages this, this issue with overlayFS. And we found this documentation that kind of went through it with along with the proof of concept. So we grabbed the proof of concept and threw it into the temp directory. And then in that temp directory, we went ahead and compiled that exploit. Sorry, compiled the payload. Mm -hmm. um, and went ahead and ran it. And you have to essentially run a few different uh, binaries. Basically at a high level, what the exploit did was there was a vulnerability with OverlayFS where you essentially have different layers of file systems. There's like a user namespace that's created and there's like a layered file system set up. And there was a vulnerability that when you copied uh, or when there was like a copy up from a lower file system to an upper file system, it maintained certain metadata, including the set UID bit. So you mm -hmm. could set the set UID bit in the lower file system. And during that copy up, it would maintain the uh, set UID bit within that upper file system when it shouldn't have. And you could leverage that to create a binary that would still run with root permissions since that set UID bit was set and the file was technically, or the binary was created by root. So you were able to leverage this vulnerability with this timing to escalate privileges to root. But at a high level, that was pretty much it. If I'm Yeah. And that about wraps it up. Be sure to go and catch us when we're live. Go to Twitch now and check our calendar to see when our next date is. We do have two different streams. We have the It Takes a Village to Learn, which is where Gar and I walk through concepts like this, and It Takes a Village to Play, which is a rarer one to see. But when you do, jump in because you will be in control of the commands that we use to solve particular machines. But take care until the next video.